We are filming in Los Angeles for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. My name is Mark Groh, and it's a great pleasure for me to have Pete Candoli with me. Welcome. Thank you, Monk. It's a pleasure to be here and a privilege. Thanks. I, I started counting the albums you've been on, and oh. I lost track at 1,335. <laughs> I, I don't have, uh, likely enough, I don't even have the old Peter Gunn things of Hank Mancini. Yeah. At the, you know, when I, that was, I don't know, 20, 40 years, 30 years, or some, some, something like that. It's just an amazing list, and uh, along with the albums, the, the people that you've been involved with musically. And yeah, it's, it's been it's quite really, impressive. It's a really, I've been so fortunate. Uh, I think most musicians, I would do it whether I, I, it was worthwhile or if I was starving, the same thing. You do it because you love music. Mm. And so it's mm. been a real privilege, because I remember my father, our father, Kato, uh, you punch a clock early in the morning, you come home, northern Indiana, and it's cold winters and things like that. And he decided, like Conte and I were going to be a little different than hanging around and working in a factory, which is very commendable because they're wonderful people, really. Yeah. You know, and they were nice people. So we got uh, both ends pretty well covered that way. He wanted something different for you. He decided than... we were going to be big time uh, musicians. Hmm. That's when the big bands were doing, yeah. you know, things yeah. like that. And, uh, uh, well, I, I don't think I disappointed, my brother and I disappointed I him at all. I guess not. <laughs> no, we were very fortunate. In fact, I think I am the youngest musician on record of uh, joining the union. My father signed me in, I was 13 years old, oh, South Bend Local. Wow. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and he got to see some of your really good oh, success. Yeah. How long did he live? Uh, he, he lived until after 60, 61, 62. Oh, great. So yeah. he, he so saw he, you with. He saw us both uh, having uh, some nice things and mm -hmm. uh, seeing us do what he had in mind all the yeah. time, which is something, you know. He was a wonderful guy. I remember I took Ziggy Elman's uh, place as before Woody's the herd, just before he went in the service, and uh, I took his place with Tommy Dorsey's band. Yeah. And Cy Oliver was writing for the band. And. Uh, we go at the, at the Hotel Sherman. They had they changed the band every two weeks. There's another name band had come in, mm -hmm. and he knew my father. Say, Tony, did you bring some wine with you? <laughs> because he loved my father's wine. My father had uh, a wine cellar with uh, bottles that were, I think, as I remember, 25 years they've been. Wow. You know, and he would wait every time we get to Chicago. He says, "Your dad coming up, pizza, yeah." <laughs> so it was quite something. You start on the French horn, is that well, correct? Well, yeah, I, I took that in orchestra. Uh -huh. uh, really, so I'll, uh, I'll give you a go-ahead. Conte and I, my brother is about four years younger than I am, uh, and in our small town, there were a, a very uh, big Italian uh, neighborhood, and they had a marching band. My father had all the instruments. He was self-taught trumpet. And he had the bass drum, he had peck horns and uh, things, and he'd pass them out to the neighbors and they'd play them. And every now and then uh, uh, we'd play uh, Italian tunes and, and, and by ear, I think I was about four or five, five or six, whatever it was, we'd walk along with the band and peck horn and pull, and pull. we knew the pulse was the important, da, 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 pull, pull, as if you're a percussive man. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we, did, we played by ear. And uh, I remember those days. As a matter of fact, <laughs> the first World's Fair was in Chicago, late 30s, I think, uh, mm -hmm. or, or I mean, I mean, early, late 20s, and starting beginning the 30s, I think. Oh, and, 1929, uh, wasn't it? The I Chicago think, World's Fair. That seems I think to so. ring a bell And the big somewhere. thing about it was uh, an Italian general by the name of Italo Balbo was bringing nonstop from Italy a squadron of Italian army planes, and they were tri-wing, three wings, and as they went over Mishawaka, which is about 100 miles from right near where South Bend is, uh, 100 miles from Chicago, everybody was waving flags, and you'd see, here they are, and you'd hear these things, and that's a, and I remember we were playing, they started playing the, what they, the fascista song, which was, uh, 
the uh, Mussolini uh, type oh. uh, thing as the, the march itself. Of course, then it was, uh, it it was, was okay. fine, you know. <laughs> it was okay. But I remember playing and playing the peck horn and then looking up at the, these planes and everybody's cheering and said, well, they, they can't hear us up there, can they? <laughs> <laughs> so Be quiet, just you know, play. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> well, it was part of uh, uh, getting acquainted with music, I guess. Yeah. I, like, uh, I played French horn uh, because I played in the orchestra also, and I doubled on French horn and trumpet. I took trumpet because of my father. Yeah. And uh, for a while, I played a string bass uh, in the school orchestra also. Mm -hmm. And uh, I. I was privileged to go to state and national three times, and uh, and I won first all three times. No. So you know it's a thing well, you do when you're in school. Or your ear must have been getting some really good training between the off beats on the peck horn and I think so, the yeah. string bass, and you know. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, oh. quite amazing. I remember coming into the eighth grade, and I had uh, 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 an old seventy-eight of uh, Petrushka, and I'm telling, trying to tell. The music teacher, like we'd always march in the classrooms on Haydn, bum 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 bum, bum. <laughs> keep in order. But I, but I was really amazed. I said, "Don't you hear what's happening?" I would tell her, Can, "Can't you hear these?" Songs? I mean, it, it killed me then. Yeah. I was in the eighth grade. He said, well, "Yes, it's very nice, Walter. That's my real name, yes. is Walter." See? Right. <laughs> and I said, "Okay." It didn't give her a charge, and I got just a bigger charge when I first heard my first Jimmy Lunsford record, a Sound, mm -hmm. and The Jitney Man by a uh, uh, guy, uh, let's see, somebody on piano voted for me for the Esquire Magazine Award, which I was elected one year, and I can't think of his name. Oh, God. With Jimmy Lunsford? Uh, no, no, he, he wasn't with Jimmy Lunsford. He, had, he recorded a thing called The Jitney Man with a big band. Uh -huh. uh, he's a drummer, originally. Uh, I'll think of it somewhere down the line. Not Chick Webb. <laughs> Chick Webb. I'll be darned. Isn't that amazing? Oh. I remember hearing that and say, ah, because very few people knew, even knew who Chick Webb, let alone get on a record. It, it, mm -hmm. uh, it's usually the hotel bands and a few oddballs that were playing for, for listeners. You know. Yes. And then it dawned upon me all the, all the hotel bands had a pattern, a sound. It's like uh, a product. It was smart, like uh, Sammy Kay had da 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 da, da ah. before the singer got up, and uh, and uh, Horace da, 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 all the triple tanging. Okay. And everybody had a thing. Tommy Dorsey even played the first 16 of a ballad, the solo tone mute with uh, clarinets in the background, first 16. I see. see and so that they style. had a signature oh, that yeah, you would um, recognize. Oh yeah, Guy You knew every time you put the needle down, it was Guy Lombardo. Yeah, the, you know? yeah. It's amazing. Wow, yeah. that's cool. Uh, so um, that's the kind of bring it up. I <laughs> Were you anxious to get out of high school and get on with it? Yes. Yeah. Yes, really. I uh, remember I was, uh, I was uh, in fact, I went to Purdue. Uh, it was uh, a guy by the name of Paul Reedy, who was uh, one of the young, youngest uh, men. He was in engineering in the faculty at Purdue. I think he was 27. Mm -hmm. and he was on the faculty, and he played piano. And he was in the logarithms and all that. Uh, figuratively speaking, you know, he had a college band. And uh -huh. some of the older, I used to, first of all, I used to ride my bicycle uh, up to the high school, which is about a mile away on Lincoln Way, which is the big main drag through Mishawaka. Every Friday, we used to play for dances. And I played all the jazz. And I remember having my tux rolling up my pants so I wouldn't get caught in the chain uh -huh. and my <laughs> trumpet and, and getting down there, I'd get off the study hall early so I, I could make the like four o'clock downbeat. That's great. And uh, I played with all these, uh, we had two ladies uh, also saxophonists and it was called Jimmy Bach and his eight cylinders of music. Oh no. And kidding. it was a, a big deal and they went on to Purdue engineering mm -hmm. and uh, uh, one, one uh, while they were up there, a couple of years, uh, I think they had a New Year's Eve gig, and they needed a, another trumpet player, uh, a, a ride man, and they said, well, you ought, ought to 
get P. Condoli. He does all the things with his son. So I said, well, could you get him one of those? So one of the guys came back, drove back to Mishawaka, which was 80 miles from mm. Purdue, the campus, and drove me up there, and I stayed all night, which was a big deal. I think I was 14. Wow, stayed overnight. Yeah, yeah, you know, I did, yeah. You're the ride man, right? Yeah, was, You're the hot plug. And I had <laughs> such a, a great time. Uh, Really, it was just marvelous. And then, of course, uh, they became my guardians, got permission from my folks. Like, uh, I lived with them oh. when I was 15, and I graduated at 16. But I went right on and stayed there at Purdue because he had, um, uh, Paul Reedy had the orchestra. Mm -hmm. And so, in the fourth meeting, I remember the second year, we had a, a, a gig for the whole summer at Sylvania, Ohio, right below uh, Toledo, and it was a big open quarry. And uh, <clears throat> the band was going to be there all summer, and they would, they, I think they were bringing in name bands uh, every other week for a couple nights a week, like uh, Charlie Spivak came through, and uh, uh, Sonny Dunham came through one night. Uh, no, two, uh, uh, and Carlos Gastel was their manager. He was a, Big heavy guy who had Peggy Lee, Nat King Cole, mm -hmm. and he, he was managing uh, Sonny Dunham. And of course, uh, I got to pick up on all these bands at that mm -hmm. time. I think we were getting eight dollars for the week, and eight? a place to stay, and a meal ticket <laughs> at the local restaurant. And this was in. Um, you know, this was let's see. Late but, 30s? Yeah, before the war. Just before yeah. the war. Okay. All right. So. And then, uh, like I said, the Carlos guy still at one time, it's two years after, was at Purdue, he says, hey, kid, you want to join the band? Well, uh, there's some, uh, somebody <laughs> by the name of Cohen was a New York trumpet player. By the, but before, which is funny, before that, at, at Purdue, Will Bradley and Ray McKinley came in for one night. Uh, to play for a dance, and I said for one of the trumpet players, he was sick or something, played all night, and I remember Ray McKinley, who was a, who was a wonderful guy, had a great drummer, really. And he said uh, he had the Boogie Woogie Band, you know, with Freddie Slack. On right, like that. yeah. And uh, I finished the gig and was really excited, and I heard overheard Ray McKinley say, you know, when that kid get some experience, he's going to be great. Just like that. I heard it and I was insulted. <laughs> this is my thinking. I was insulted. Now, so what does he mean? What do you mean? He said, I'm going to be great. Well, so I can do anything Harry does, which I, I used to do all the Harry's all the technical things Harry uh -huh. did. I says, I can imitate uh, what, 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 and I can play anything. What does he mean by that? Well, a few years later, I knew exactly what he meant. <laughs> Experience. You can't explain it. You just got to get it. I'll be done. And it'll happen, really. Yeah. yeah it's something you, you do and live through, playing with other musicians, listening to this, listening to that, being influenced here. Everything makes you what you are or your makeup. You yeah. can have all the facilities in the world. I did. Mm -hmm. Play anything, you know, anything I wanted. I was just, I was very natural. Music, uh, uh, trumpet came very easy for me. Uh -huh. And uh, these are the experiences I got. And then you wind up with the Charlie Barnetts, and then I played with uh, with Basie for a short time. Uh, and Duke, I did a picture with Duke Ellington's uh -huh. band. They did a they uh, they hired me extra at Paramount. Some some picture of his band, and they hired me there to pl play oh. along with a band. I see. You know, and uh, and it's such wonderful guys, yeah. really. Well, let me ask you about the first herd. How that came about? Well, I was with the band, Teddy Powell had a band. And it's very similar as the first heard in style. On that band was Buddy DeFranco, uh, clarinet, and there was um, Boots Mozilla, uh, and uh, Charlie Ventura was on the band. It was really, and uh, a different guy, George Handy was writing for the band charts for the band, and uh, uh, Eddie Finkel, composer, uh, was writing charts, and they were, it was pretty outside in a sense. And uh, I joined the band, and we were, I remember being with the band about three or four uh, months, and I got a call from 
two attorneys by the name of Vellon and Goldfarb that were Woody Herman's partners. I see. You see? They were the attorneys handling the band. And the fact that I go back and remember, it was a three-way split, which is pretty good for attorneys. I guess. <laughs> it was 60-40 Woody was doing all the work, you know, yeah. I feel. And uh, about joining the band, so I said, so well, OK, what well, does it pay, that type of thing? He said, well, so what do you have to have? He said, well, send me a telegram, so on. I said, I think I said something. I didn't care to leave, necessarily, uh, Teddy Pop, because it was a good band. I was very happy. He said, well, uh, how about $250, which is a lot of money, because I remember joining Will, Randy, and Ray McKinley when I was at the Frank Daly's Meadowbrook with Sonny Dunham, Carlos mm -hmm. Gastel. I finally joined the band after I playing see. with it. And I went to Frank Daly's Meadowbrook, and they were going to, that was, it was because they had two air shots a night on radio. And being there for three months would build a band. The yeah. band would go out and uh, get booked very nice and easily then, because people would know them. And during that stint there, uh, I got a call. I, no, I didn't get a call. I heard that Will Bradley was looking for a trumpet man. And they were rehearsing in Nola Studios in New York. And I, I quite don't remember how I got there on the day off or something. But I let Ray McKinley or someone know that uh, I was interested. And they said, well, we're rehearsing in Nola's and mm -hmm. when you can. So I went there and I sat in and says, the job is yours. You know, I, I think I was making about seventy, seventy dollars for the week with the Sunday Dunham. They gave us cabins or something, and uh, so I, um, and, uh, and that was a good band Sunday Dunham had. Really, mm -hmm. well, Yohan Racy was playing lead then. Right. He was just a kid himself. Oh yeah. yeah. And uh, so I went to Nola's and sat in with the band. I said, so, well, you got the job if you want. I said, oh, fantastic, you know. And it was a hot band because it had the Roger Silverware program half hour every week. Mm -hmm. The band was featured on the Roger Silverware program. And um, I said, yeah, I'd like to make it. He said, can you give you two weeks? I'll give you two weeks notice and then I'll, yeah. So I joined Will Bradley for a guarantee of $90 a week. <laughs> Plus, um, uh, the radio show paid extra. I think it was thirty dollars for the half-hour radio show. Mm -hmm. So that was big time, supposedly, you know. And of course, after being with uh, Will Bradley, the, it was Charlie Barnett, uh, which was pretty uh, an episode in itself. I remember uh, uh, playing the theater in Harlem, and there was Dizzy was there in the band. Al Kelly and me, a, little, a good job player, a short guy, Jimmy Pupa from uh, Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. and things like that. And, uh, and George Saravo was an outside writer. He was writing charts for the band, and of course, you didn't have to play a pop tune to be with that band. Just oh. play. It was a good musician's band. And I, uh, I wonder what I, where I went after that. I went, that was it. Before, I was right after Will Bradley, as before yeah. going to Woody. And then, and then in, in between, I came back to the West Coast once, and Freddie Slack had a band, so I hung around Los Angeles mm -hmm. for a while and played with Freddie Slack's band and that type of thing, and then went back out and joined um, uh, as before Woody's band again. Yeah. Quite a trumpet section. Oh, yeah. In 1946. Yeah, we had a. You had a, Conrad. Yeah, you know, Gaz came on the band after a while. Is yeah. that you call them? You call them Gaz? Yeah, Gazzo. Ga Conrad Gazzo. I call him yeah. Gaz. Gazzo. In fact, okay. Anis, he was my closest friend. Uh, uh huh. And his first child's godfather. That's oh. very, very. Wow. Now, in that trumpet section, was uh, Conrad was uh, lead? Well, I don't know. Hot we man? split it. He, you split it? No, I, I, I did. Uh, well, he was a, lead, a wonderful lead player. But we had already been established with uh, Wild Root and all the things, you know. And um, so he felt right at home. And he played just wonderful. Mm -hmm. played, played great. Marvelous sound. And uh, it turned out just great. He was there. And we had quite a uh, Marky Markowitz was on the band at one time. Neil Hefty was on the band. And um, we had uh, the five trumpets to see. Goss and I can't think of uh, 
who was with us at that time. Sonny Berman? Oh, Sonny, yeah. yeah. It was Sonny, Neil Hefty. Even Shorty Rogers was on our I mean, Shorty, I Shorty, yeah. Shorty was before Gaz, even. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Shorty and Marky Markowitz. Yeah. Me and Sonny was on the band at that time. And Lou, uh, uh, Lou Irvin or something, somebody from Detroit for a while. Gosh. <laughs> There's a lot of people. <laughs> I know. They go in and out, don't yeah, they? Yeah, I know, like uh, in 48, I remember uh, joining uh, Tex Meneke in the Miller Band, because God says, come on on the band, you know, you got to come on the band. So I did that. Well, before that, well, I, I was back on the West Coast, and I, uh, I joined Les Brown and went to the Elitch's Gardens. I remember it was the first gig, and we were there, and after about a week, and he was such a wonderful guy. I said, look, uh, I said, uh, Les, I don't think I'm going to be too happy. I said, well, we're giving you billing. It's the feature, you know. You're taking uh, Jim, Jimmy Zito's book, you know, with the solos. And I said, well, you know, I, I'm, this is after the first heard you. I said, I can't, I don't think um, I'm going to be happy. Maybe I ought to get somebody else less, you know. Yeah. Because I, I, I know the type of music I like to play, so Pete, whatever you want, but we should let her have your stay, you know. I see. So I Music, left. Musically, it wasn't something you well, thought you'd You know, I've got to be very honest. To me, it felt like... Uh, it felt like an overblown hotel band. Uh -huh. You understand? Yeah. Instead of, like, instead of five brass or three tops of the trombone, four side, they had eight brass, you know. But it didn't go too far above as far as I was concerned, yeah. you know. I was more too interested in playing. Right. Getting into things. You know, when you look at um, the, the bios of the different guys in the big bands, it seems that there's about a two year period where, I mean, let me, let me rephrase this. It seems that not often does a guy stick with a band for more than two or three years. Yeah, well, pretty close. I mean, is it an economic, partly economic, is it partly the music? Well, maybe both. Uh, I would think if it felt like me, it was principally music. Because I would, pay, I'd rather play for less and know that, uh, like, uh, something was happening. You see, and but the uh, different bands that uh, afforded uh, a good livelihood to, to musicians, especially the hotel bands that stayed in one spot for mm -hmm. <laughs> six weeks. It was a long time. It seems like a lifetime to th the way bands were playing and uh, going back and yeah. forth in those days. And uh, I, I think uh, some had kids, you know, being away from right. uh, kids and yeah. and and. Uh, Others want to continue their uh, academic uh, ways, you know, and maybe uh, wind up teaching or sure. Many, because many you classes. were really young men at, the, oh, at that time. I was just having, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you were sixteen. Oh yeah, that's when, right. before when I first yeah. went right to Purdue, when I did the things as well, Will Bradley, I was, you know, at the at the, the campus. I was there two of the second year. You know, I think Conti told me a story about. You were playing in Chicago or something, and you forgot your mouthpiece. <laughs> Probably. You had to come up and deliver it to you. Or yeah, something. Or again? something yeah, yeah. He, uh, yes, I, I think I remember that. I says, I didn't have my mouthpiece, and you can't play like you play without a mouth. It's like wearing someone else's gloves. Oh, uh -huh. shoes. They don't. Uh, something's wrong with them. See, especially when you're, uh, no, this is, you know, it's like uh, I have no calluses on my hands, so I can't play the guitar uh -huh. even for you. Uh -huh. It's not about that simple. Yeah. I didn't even worry about anything, to be honest with you, but uh, I remember. I remember when I was at Tommy Dorsey's at the Sherman Hotel, uh, Hotless Page had a band, a small group. They play in between. And then uh -huh. the Tommy, and then we'd do the set, and then and, uh, Hotless Page would play. And, and he had a saxophone player that was playing weird. He was going for. For runs, you know, trying to make certain runs, I said it was fine, but uh, with the rhythm saying, and it was Charlie Parker. <laughs> it was bird, unbelievable. So wow, that guy's going for runs, but uh, I didn't understand, you know, you know, because I was, to be honest with you, too technically, too young, 
mm -hmm. and, and doing things mm -hmm. that way. But I wasn't saying anything. <laughs> the difference, you know? Yeah, yeah, you've got to say something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You got the Esquire Award uh, New Star in 1946. Yeah, that's... Uh, is this nice? Who posed it for me? Uh, God, that's... A, got the band leader. Oh, no, yeah. Uh, I'll tell you who wrote it for me. Um, Boy Meets Horn. What's his name? I'm sorry? Uh, Boy Meets Horn uh, with Duke Ellington. Uh, oh, Rex, uh, Rex Stewart. Rex Stewart, God yeah. bless him. Well, he was a... What a wonderful musician he was. Mm -hmm. you know, the composition on Boy Meets Horn. Yeah. Is, we had a lot of other uh, things he, he had written. Just marvelous musician. Mm -hmm. And of course, one of a kind, I think, you know. So how did the, did you eventually decide, let's see, late 40s, early 50s, that um, the road thing was well, getting a little old. I'll try, I'll try. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't getting too old, no, really. But I was into it. I, I remember, like uh, in four, uh, at '43, I think with Tommy Dorsey's band or '42 or something. I took Ziggy's place. I remember playing lead on an all-star uh, metronome date, mm -hmm. and Sweets was there. Uh, Sweets uh, and Harry Edison, my dear friends. We do a lot of the. The Bruno things that with Lionel had doing the Golden Men the music, yes. you know that, and uh, and he was and I, I ran in, I found an old album and I don't have any albums. I, this must have been really in storage somewhere. Tommy Deutsch was playing lead trombone. I was playing lead trumpet on the date. It was four or five trumpet players. Sweets I remember being one of them. Dud Bascom was another. Dud Bascom. So, oh wow. Yeah yeah. And uh, I remember taking uh, Cootie Williams' place with, uh, with Benny Goodman at the, the, New, the New Yorker Hotel for mm -hmm. about, I was there about, uh, and it's amazing. We were there, I think, uh, for six weeks, and Vito Musa was on the band, Jaime Scherzer was playing lead, uh, Brad McGowan on Valtron, it was really a good band, but I, I didn't care about anything, you know, I heard all these, the ray and things like that, how he, he, yeah. how he used to think, but uh, I remember the night before we opened up, Guy Lombardo's band was there, and uh, um, I was kind of snickering a little bit because it's really, it was music compared to where I was looking, yeah. you understand? But it was great for what it was. I remember going in the back room, uh, and there's this guy, so these guys are with Benny, they come in, oh, hi, hi, and then some are playing cards in the, in, the, in the band room, and some are saying, I think you ought to pick up a hundred uh, shares of that AT&T and things like that. They were into that as I was a kid, you understand? But to me, it didn't mean anything because I had no idea what they were doing. Uh -huh. But later I recognized they were in the stocks and so on, I was the only cared about the music. I see. <laughs> so it was kind of funny later on when I realized what was happening that I didn't know. You know uh -huh. It's the old story about uh, uh, Mark Twain saying, I remember I was, when I was 15 or 16, I remember my father just about, when he was, I was about 20, about four or five years later, I was amazed to learn how much he, my father had learned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I, I was amazed how yeah. much I had learned thinking back what was really happening in reality. That whole experience thing again. There yeah, no yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so um, I uh, finally with, with Woody's band, I was called. They had a Teen Time show on NBC in uh, California. Uh, it's called a Teen Time show. It was on television. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but before, before that, I was Boyd Rayburn's band, which is really outside. Uh, they had all, really charts. We were going to open up, he had a backer for the band, Boyd did, and uh, the band was a real outside band. George Handy was doing charts and people like that. And uh, they were going into a place called the Hurricane, which is a right, in Manhattan above, right near Nola Studios. And we're gonna open up a supper club with uh, uh, Gertrude Neeson, who was the star of the show, and Boyd Raven was the band. We had uh, 
Eight Brass, Bernie Glow was uh, Gaz, me and Bernie Glow, Marky and some other trumpet. We had uh, four rhythm and a mallet man and a harp. Wow. In the woodwinds, we had uh, seven woodwinds, which included bassoon, and, uh, and also there was a tuba. And uh, Ginny Sim, uh, Ginny, not Ginny Sim, Ginny, can't think of her name, was Boyd Raven's wife. She sang. But we were rehearsing, and while we were rehearsing at Nola's, like Johnny Richards was writing, a wonderful writer. God, he's great. Poor orchestra, really. Yeah. And I remember uh, we were on, we were receiving a check, I think I was getting $250. We, well, we weren't doing anything because the club wasn't fixed, uh, uh, finished. Uh, we were just rehearsing like a couple of shots a week for the, about three weeks before we finally went in. Mm -hmm. And that was an excellent band. And Buddy DeFranco was on that band. And uh, Boots was on that band, Boots Mazzillo. Uh, Leon Cox on trombone. Oh, wonderful facilities he had. <laughs> I mean, uh, Dick Knoll was another trombone player. Like, Gaz, I, uh, and I can't think of, Marky was there, Markowitz, and it was an excellent band. And we were there for about six weeks. And there's a man by the name of Stillman Pond, his wife was very big in real estate. The whole payroll was paying the whole wow. payroll, which is a backer. Yeah. That's a pretty large group to back. Yeah, oh, yeah, and especially in those days, the fighting the backer is like, what? Yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, you've racked up so many recordings, and I want to I want to play sure. one for you. Okay. It's a um, real nice sound to it. Is, is that uh, Marty Page tend that thing? Possible. Uh, it's just uh, Jerry Mulligan, Tenet. Oh, oh God. Yeah, it's a long time. Yeah. Wow. I, I knew it was in that. Oh, yeah, marvelous. He was really writing beautiful, wasn't he? Mm hmm. God. Beautiful stuff. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes, I remember it now. It goes back. Of course I remember it, yeah. This is while I was in Hollywood. And uh, uh, at that time, uh, because I went in to lead the Teen Time show uh, on television. I was the character. I had Ronnie Lang, Ted Nash was in the, you know, a bunch of uh, studio players now. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was my thing before going with Peggy Lee with the... Uh, Jimmy Rose, Joe Mondragon, mm -hmm. Jack Costanza was on bongos. Like we love her, you know, when you're near me and all that. Yeah. And we stayed with her for about a year, year and a half. And played places in New York, Levian Rose, New York for six weeks. And you know, the, the Black Coffee album mm -hmm. in New York, as a matter of fact. And um, then back, of course, and the Teen Time show lasted about six months. And uh, that's when I stayed there, and I, Frank, that's just when Frank, uh, I joined a staff at ABC, uh -huh. about 51, I think it was, and uh, did a bunch of outside things, and then I decided I don't want to be tied down on staff because I wanted to play more, so I did independent shows like I did the Frank Sinatra show. He had his own TV show. That's, I guess he had just married or uh, Ava Gardner then, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that type of thing. That's when I started traveling with him for a while. Well, I, <laughs> I'm thinking all these people in wrong spots, probably. But I was in, in uh, California, Hollywood at the time, wow. you know, Los Angeles. Yeah. Is there a West Coast jazz sound to your ears? The, Not really. The jazz historians say, you know, they think, well, West Coast. That's all right. They want to say that. That's fine. <laughs> I think it was just players that uh, were here on the West Coast, like Shorty Rogers was really. Uh, Milton Renowski mm -hmm. is his name. He's from New York, you know. I, uh, and he played the way he played, and they want to say he's on the West Coast and he's playing that way. Okay. That's fine, see. Yeah. But there's, 
is not really uh, on the East Coast and the West Coast. Tiny Khan, the drummer, wrote some great charts, East Coast, you know, and that whole group with Johnny Mandel, so right, Al Cohen, mm -hmm. all these players of that type. Bernie Glow was a trumpet player I was trying to think of, wonderful player. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there, there is, you know, like, uh, oh gosh. It's like trying to say uh, JJ and K, you know, winning. Mm -hmm. Kai Winning came from uh, Kai, it's from uh, Washington, D.C. He play, came out, got more recognized with Stan Kenton's band there mm -hmm. for a while. I wouldn't call him West Coast or East Coast. It's just, it's just music. To me, to me, there is no difference in sound. It isn't like you've got a Latin band <laughs> versus a swing band, right. you know, like Xavier Cougat and Duke Ellington. Yeah, you yeah. can tell the difference in right. the orchestras. But not in the individual musicianship. See uh, what jazz yeah. is. Did in all the playing you've done, did you ever have uh, any physical problems that that you know kind of put a crimp in your activities for a while? Oh, uh, <laughs> only one time with Woody's band. Uh, I had a, a Scotty who used to travel me, with me all the time. My little Scotty, and. Uh, one night I came home from the uh, uh, Sherman Hotel and little Scotty was asleep on the bed. I guess I awakened it and it snapped unconsciously and bit me right on the lip. Oh, jeez. So, of course, uh, it bled and swelled up a little bit. But they said, well, I better cool up. Just get a sub at least while we're at the hotel for a few days or something, which we did. But they wrote a big deal about it, like, uh, Oh, People yeah, right. Written on, uh, been on the lid by those and so on. But uh, not, not that I know. I used to work out all the time at Sid Klein's Gin in New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a help now, to be honest with you. Then uh, at one time, I think uh, I weighed about 225 and looked about four foot high because of, I wore a 46 coat. Wow. I figured that was it. I was young. I was really into it. Then it dawned upon me later, a little more sensibly, like all your energy and strength is internal, really, not the big bulgy muscles. That uh -huh. does give you the energy and the strength. So I, I started with more repetitions with lighter weights. I see. For more definition. <laughs> <laughs> but that's truth, you know. You probably could have won the bodybuilding contest, well, at a, least within the musician. Uh, sure, <laughs> I, I probably could have done that very easily. Yeah. Wow. They put me on the cover of Bernard. Yeah. When was the Make first uh, time that you got in a band that was uh, significantly in integrated? Well, uh, Woody's band. Uh huh. I remember when uh, we did. Uh, they had the Esquire magazine. We had uh, the Battle of Bands of Duke Ellington, who was the year before. I think forty five was it. Uh, mm -hmm. Had won uh, the uh, Downbeat All Star Band, the pick of the uh, band. And following year, 45, Woody won a band, uh, Woody's band, the Herman Herd. So we had a battle of bands on stage, so to speak, you know. Mm -hmm. was, and the narrator was Orson Welles. Oh. <laughs> and then uh, it was put on my Esquire magazine. And I remember we were all individually introduced. And that's uh, later on we had uh, uh, Woody had his own show, you know, with for Wild Root, and that's when we premiered oh. uh, Ebony Concerto by Stravinsky yes. had written for us. I'll right. tell you that episode sometime about Paramount Theater, <laughs> what went on, <laughs> rehearsing his music. I guess that was pretty difficult, right? I mean, you were playing shows. Yeah, it was difficult. Well, I'll tell you, it was difficult to play it correctly because uh, playing it correctly, I mean, playing with uh, certain finesse that's required, but not hitting double B flats on the trumpet, you know, where you're, I'm screaming above the band. Right. Uh, six and eight shows uh, on weekends at the Paramount. Uh -huh. uh, that is not conducive to playing delicate. Yes. And uh, with finesse. And the one, uh, one part of it, is, it opens up with the woodwinds, I guess. And now this is a Woody's band. Uh, then the fugue starts in, and at one point he has 
I think da 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 on guitar. Da 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 da. That's acoustic. Yeah. And just Don Lamont, who had the band at the time, instead of Davy Tuff, and he was on the brush like. No, not sticks, pressure. Like him in on my high C. On your high C. Yo, the intervals alone, so I said, oh my God, I said, you know, with a leather lip, not geared for the finesse, but I knew it had to be, and in fact, he conducted us in, uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, Los Angeles mm -hmm. uh, for the recording that we did with Woody's band. Wow. Yeah. That must have been difficult for guys who were mostly used to reading, you know, swing music, yeah, well, to play the stuff that he wrote. Uh, it was for certain people, like the clarinet part had a lot to be desired. I mean, uh, and guys that didn't really read or have any legitimate training, uh, it was very tough. Chuck you know, Jackson was on the band then? She, wasn't yes, he? and I, we, <laughs> I gotta tell you the story. We we're, we're premiered it with Walmer Hindle a conductor, mm -hmm. pianist and associate conductor of New York Philharmonic. They had uh, Stravinsky, they still have Stravinsky Month every New York Philharmonic every year. And he had, Mickey Fuller's played bass clarinet, and this, which was uh, Tom Tom, brum, 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 and bass, ba, 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 one straight, and Mickey Fullis and Chubby is playing Arco. Uh, and he doesn't Arco. He never plays. He's not a bow man, right? Not at all. <laughs> he goes, uh, da, da. And Walter Hendel's going like this. Like, oh, more. <laughs> like, bring it up, you know. And Chubby, and Chubby's got so frustrated, he says, I already got it up to seven. You stop playing. And then he had an amplifier for his bass. Oh. He says, I already got it up to seven. <laughs> We're on the air. <laughs> I'll tell you, Gaz and I, we couldn't contain ourselves. <laughs> Just, I mean, sweating with laughter. It's uh, terrible. God. Terrible, terribly unprofessional, to be honest with you. But the band, this was the way the band, you know, you said, hey, the bus leaves at nine. Well, people are struggling at 10. This is, uh, the eggs were slow in getting to the counter and all that, you know. I mean, think about it. You're on your own trip, see? Yeah. And um, <laughs> so a lot of musicians that were good that came to the West Coast when they say it's a 9 o'clock call, it means 9 o'clock downbeat. You know, you might have 40, 50 men. And the clock starts going. So they had to get used to that 9 o'clock means 9 o'clock at Paramount downbeat. Yeah. See? Be there. A whole different a life. A whole different life. Yeah. You don't even think about it. Mm. It must have been a, a bit of a adjustment yeah to well you have to say well this is what am i doing here i mean if i'm doing this i must participate in what is ex expected yeah. and uh i've done so many motion pictures with all composers from michelle you know Legrand, from you name them you know and which to thank god you know man with the golden arm mm -hmm. with Elmer Bernstein yeah it goes on and on especially with Hank all the things we've done man see you know yeah I, I really I haven't thought about this in a long time to be honest with you Just, you know how many years did you put into this studio I when I went in the studio I was doing I was doing a minimum of six half hour shows with a week with Earl Hagen, Herbie Spencer, who, God bless a wonderful guy, he used to orchestra for Castellanos and people for years ago in New York. And he, in fact, he was doing a lot for John Williams. Who, oh. That's a whole different story I'll bring in. I lived next to his folks before he came into town. Uh, <laughs> great piano player John is, hmm. really, more so than anything else. Sometime we'll go into it. Okay, all right. <laughs> but uh, uh, at that time, like, uh, like I guess said, from uh, uh, Alfred Newman to Hugo Friedhofer to uh, you name them, I've done so much that I'm George Dooney, Bell Book and Candle, and things uh, Count and I did with a small group within the, the Swimming Broadway play. 
I see. Uh, I, I think of them, it's pretty funny. It's like first time doing uh, Peter Gubb with Hank Mancini. So uncertain was he that it would be picked up, Blake Edwards as the producer, you know, uh, that they'd have a, a shot and all of it skyrocketed. He gave the first single to uh, Ray Anthony was a friend of him. He'd written for Ray Anthony. He said, if you guarantee me you'll put it out as a single, he says, I'll, I'll make sure you're the only one with the single on it, on the theme hmm. of Peter Gunn. To and Ray Anthony? Anthony? Yeah. Because, uh -huh. And, of course, Ray Anthony could do what he wanted. He had a contract with the Capitol. At the time, he, he did it for Hank, like, you know, and, of course, you know the rest. And yeah. Hank only had the album out on RCA Victor, hmm. but not the single, you know. Oh. Yeah. Wow. There were things like... Uh, uh, in the script, there were things like uh, Mom's Place, where there's a off-the-road uh, type cafe and bar where Peter Gunn used to hang out. They were thinking, how about Shorty Rogers? He's at, with RCA Victor, and he's a contract. He has a contract there, and why not do something like Shorty Rogers at Mom's Place? And 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 Hank said, no, it's my music. I want to do it. If you want my music, mm -hmm. and. That was it. The rest is history. Yeah. He was a wonderful orchestrator mm -hmm. and a composer, Hank is, you know. Yeah. He was, you know. Did he mostly do his own orchestrating? Oh, he did, yeah. yeah. Wonderful orchestrator. He had all the tools. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Marvelous. And, uh, you know, it's like John Williams, a wonderful orchestrator. You know, what do you want, Ricard Strauss? Pull out the file and, mm -hmm. like, or anybody, you know. Do you have any recollections of, of days in the studio when? You really were hurting for one reason or another. You really didn't have it, and it was a struggle for you to get through a, a cue or something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I really, I really don't know, no, because uh, uh, it's, it's a habit. You see, when you're uh, considered a top studio player, your facilities, whatever it is, legitimately, uh, you, know, you ever hear One Eyed Jacks by Hugo Friedhofer? That's the Marlon Brando picture. Yes. Yeah. Oh, what, a, <laughs> what an orchestra. He, I mean, he is so, such a good composer that you don't need a time, a clock to catch a cue. If you play it naturally like it's written, it falls. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's just one of these people, you know. And, uh, Anybody who writes like this, they don't use a C trumpet instead of a B flat trumpet and write like it's a B flat trumpet. Uh -huh. There's a difference in quality between the C. So it has a different edge, a different pitch. Good composers will, 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 will know that and use it and write in the right register for that. So he gets that sound, uh -huh. things like this. that. Uh, uh, you know, just writing for, okay, that's a trumpet, that's a trumpet, yeah. you know. <laughs> and uh, these things become a matter of habit. The longer I was here, I've done so many with so many different composers, like Michelle, who'd rather sing and play piano instead of write, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. And he sounds terrible when he sings. Oh. Uh, you know, I got piano, I love him, you know. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, because uh, I remember, he studied with Ma uh, Madame uh, Boulanger, a French lady who used to teach uh, oh, composition. A lot, a lot of people have studied with her. Right. And if I, but all of us people who studied with her were Roy Harris, my composition teacher. Mm -hmm. He studied with her when he was, he was a, a played composer when he was 27. Wow. And, and good, you know, and uh, he said, well, I have to have some drawn out fights with her to prove her wrong. He said, give me two weeks, I'll show you you're wrong. So, Musically, it is. Mm. I mean, there's some things that come out that are just unbelievable. I said, so the person that, that showed Igor Stravinsky orchestration was a Frenchman, not uh, the Russian that they say. Oh. They studied with a uh, yeah. uh, famous Russian guy. No, it was a Frenchman on orchestration. <laughs> Judy Garland, oh. Elvis Gerald, Peggy Lee. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> how, how long do we have here, right? But well, uh, yeah. Well, just let me. I'm talking too much. I'm sorry. No. What kind of things stick out in your <clears throat> mind uh, with uh, some of these stars? Are they oh, are they great to work with? The majority of yeah. them. Yeah. 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 They are. If, if, uh, usually, uh, the more they've done the less frightened they are and the nicer they are. 
Mm. You see? Yep. And uh, Frank, you know, so I traveled with Frank for about four or five years. And in fact, he, uh, his pilots flew me into Vegas many times, at least at least uh, six, seven times I can think of. I catch because of the one show at 10 o'clock, and I finished the Carol Burnett show like a, at about 8.30, quarter or 9 or 9 o'clock, and I try to rush out. They have a car for me and go to Burbank, and they take off, and I'd be there for the downbeat. In Las Vegas? Vegas? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, it's a lot of people like that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and always, Frank was really great. Mm. I was there when the guy pulled the gun on him. You know, uh, there's a big scene that had we were all sitting around. I didn't, I'm not familiar well, with. Somebody had pulled the gun on him, so I had a gripe from one of the other owners of one of the other places or something. Mm -hmm. When he supposedly drove a golf cart into the pool years before or something. Oh, and everybody. Uh, we're sitting there, and he says, "Hey, this guy's older oh, guy comes up and says, I dare you, who do you dare you? And I pull out a gun, and the officers are right there around Frank, you know, like that, grab him like this. Yes. And he said, okay, fellas, that's it, it's a wrap. We have one more show, that's why we're doing two shows tonight at Caesars. He said, it's a wrap, let's go. That was it. We had about another week and a half, I think. Many incidents happen, but yeah. I'm sure you're more interested in the music aspect or how uh, uh, the lives, the things that uh, musicians go through mm -hmm. can be so difficult, you know. Yeah. But uh, you remained a uh, pretty healthy yeah. fellow. Uh, yeah. Not so with, with some of the musicians. Yeah, you know, there was a time when dissipation was a thing, unfortunately. You know, the drug scene, or when you're strung out. Well, it's like when people used to booze, you know, like to take drinks. Later on, I'm talking about 45, 50 years ago, when nobody thought anything of drinking, but then they found out this thing called alcoholism. You know, and then later, a few uh, alcoholic anonymous, things like that, because it's a real. Uh, sickness in a sense, you know, mm -hmm. they know it, if it's in the genes from prior, uh, that it can be very, and I, I, I used to remember guys that had to have a few drinks before they can play, you know, and that's too bad, you know, because of, I don't know why, nice guys, the nicer you are, as a, one of my closest friends, Jimmy Rolls, you yeah. know, was an alcoholic, and we, we traveled with Peggy, and Probably the doctor says, hey, says, I don't want to be your doctor. I don't, I don't want to be responsible. And God bless him. Such a beautiful guy and such a monster, musically speaking. Yes. Oh, yeah, really. Other people like that, friends, I, could, I go on talking mm -hmm. about him. I mean, wonderful people, wonderful guys, and gave me so much inspiration. Mm -hmm. And uh, really... I've been a very lucky guy. What's your experience been overseas? Fine. <clears throat> the reception, of course, they, they know more about an artist over there than they do here in the States. It's like one time I went over with uh, Benny Carter, a bunch of uh, different guys, players, you know, Frank West, mm -hmm. and uh, really some wonderful players. And about 10, 12 men in concerts, and we land in Narita Airport, and there's white sheets from a bed, a uh, kingside probably, all strung together, welcome, Peek Pe and Noli in black, or Alan Benny Carter, all the guys' names, and we got our people uh, applauding, the, the fans, they know if we played third trumpet on one tune, and who played lead, who took the song, they know. Uh, this is in Japan? In Japan. Oh. Yeah, they, and they know, they know this, they make a study, this, to them it's history. And they know every artist, where it was recorded, the year, afternoon date or evening date. And uh, <laughs> right away they take, they're in the stretch limos, Cadillacs, about six or seven of them take us to, the, to uh, one of the whole major hotels uh, for all the press. Well, we're being checked in by yes. the management and all, and we're there with odeurs and talking and and they're shooting pictures, just like you think the Rolling Stones came to town. 
Yeah. It's unbelievable. Really, it's just marvelous. Mm. And even in Europe, that's how they acknowledge the players. They know who you are. Yeah. What's uh, your playing routine these days? Uh, well, Kant and I have been doing very well together as the brothers. Yeah. In fact, we've got a CD coming out, and we were both fortunate of being inducted uh, in the in the National Jazz Hall of Fame, which was nice. Yeah. Uh, some good company. Matt Cole's wife was there posthumously picking up a trophy for him, and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people, Chet Baker, different people that have been inducted, you know. And uh, and that's done a lot for us as Brothers Network. We're finally coming out with, we've done it already. It'll be released by Hindsight Records. Mm -hmm. uh, just released a, an album done by Super Sax in Japan. They got hold of that. They pull out choice things, I think, you know. They're yeah. Very particular who they release. So uh, that plus the concerts we're doing, we'll be doing, we'll be going uh, to, to um, not uh, to not Phoenix, uh, the Scottsdale. Uh, that's where the next one is being held in May. Oh. The, the new winners uh, to, in, to be inducted in, in the Jazz Hall of Fame, uh -huh. and it's a three-day affair, black tie that type of thing. Uh, I think. Clint Eastwood was going to uh, MC one of, one of them, I don't know, wow. maybe this one. And um, so that's one thing that we're doing. Uh, we're doing different colleges, which we do. Uh, we usually, we've done uh, Lionel Hampton School of Music uh, three or four times together. Mm -hmm. We're not doing it this, this February. Uh, we'll be playing, um, we'll, uh, they're booking a, we're doing a uh, ship booked on a ship for six days, which will take our own rhythm section, Conti and I. Uh, and then uh, we're playing the university, some college, Imperial College, uh, right near, oh, the border below is uh, south. It's east of uh, San Diego. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll be doing a one-night concert there. And uh, I think uh, Conti and I will give a seminar to the music department, right. you know. That. You seem to have played right through the rock and roll <laughs> revolution <laughs> well, intact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very lucky. Uh -huh. I think that's when I did most of the work in the studio, then branched out for a hit and a miss every now and then. Yeah. You know, and then we were very lucky with Alabama and Chicago. We, they asked us to dub on like several years ago on if we could overdub some things. Alabama? Yeah. Yeah, and Chicago. Uh, Chicago, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, many other mm. groups. You know, they like the sound of something acoustic for a change. Uh -huh. Of course. Which is great. They're always, you know, there are some good good musicians, you know, uh, really marvelous players. Uh, you know, but there's so much thrown, <laughs> heavy garbage thrown in. It's like jazz sometimes, you know. You can hear it all the time, or blues, or what you call jazz, or fine, or the, the, the good things you want to pick out that are memorable. And uh, academically speaking, memorable, uh -huh. yeah. good interpretation for a jazz, you know, type of thing. And then there's a lot of filler, you know. Yeah, a lot of filler. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good use of yeah, word. Yeah, and they, thank God bless, everybody can do something. Uh -huh. really, I don't care what field you're in, it's country, western, do it the best it can. That's my kind of philosophy, uh -huh. you know. I don't put anything down like that. It's, that's it, you know, and their taste and what they like is as valid as mine. I'm just another person. Mm -hmm. Hopefully uh, they would respect me the same with my taste. I don't know. Yeah. But I, <laughs> but I'm talking so much, really. That's why you're but, here. <laughs> I know. I mean, I mean, please. No. Um, it's amazing when you think of, uh, you could be riding down the street and uh, be listening to something yeah. old or fairly new. and. Yeah. He, you probably think, you know, I think I played on that. I kind of, yeah, you know, uh, so, yeah, somebody, a guy puts up a little music magazine about trumpets or something, Paul Darris is his name, uh -huh. and nice, uh, he showed me some albums and records and things like, is this from the motion picture songs of your souls? I don't even remember them, honestly I don't. Yeah. I. I It's okay, you know, not that they're not having been worthwhile, I just... Right, well, it's almost like, I guess when asking a, a, an accountant, 
<laughs> Do you remember when you went to work on January 4th, 1995 or something? Yeah. Yeah, right. Just I'm, about. Just in a sense, yeah. It would be. But, but your uh, the degree of professionalism you've been able to keep over the years. Yeah, I been, have to commend you for that. I know. Thank you. I've been very lucky. I've been in the right places. I know some players that just marvelous is some of these stage bands, really. I remember Ella Mizzuti, you know, Vizzuto? El, El Vizzuti? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What a wonderful guy and what a tremendous player. Really, wonderful. Uh, 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 and uh, one time I, I tried to place, I play a place called El Chapultepec every year in Denver. It's mm -hmm. called the El Chapultepec, which is the grasshopper. It's called. Oh. And the guy who runs it is Jerry Krantz, no cover, no man, and he takes care of the uh, artists financially and every other way. And I said, you know, there's a guy by the name of Alan Rizzuti. He's just phenomenal. I mean, you said, well, yeah, I know, uh, but uh, so you ought to bring him in. He said, well, you know, Pete, you know, i got to have some people that people know. Mm -hmm. See, I've been around with him. I said, well, they'll know him once he's here. Yeah, I mean, you'll have him back. He said, oh, OK, I'll think about it if there's a slow thing or something. Ah. It's hard to get people in. He said, well, how do you get a, a record date? Or how do you re get your recording? And so, Oh, there's no real rule. Nowadays, people do it, pay for it themselves. Yeah, you know, yeah, you, either that, or or a special deal of some kind, or something. And you know, no, no, we we did with the Metropole Orchestra. We opened up the Metropole, uh, uh, the Trumpet Guild. Uh, 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 it was the, I think, the fifth Trumpet Guild, that, or, or brass Trumpet Guild, they call it, in in Holland. And then they had trumpet players from uh, uh, South America, uh, Maurice Andre of France performed with the Philharmonic, uh, and I got to meet uh, uh, Tim Timothy uh, uh, Dockshuster, the great Russian trumpet player. <laughs> and it was uh, Chuck Finley and Bob Finley brothers, and, and Conti and I, we went over there with the Metropole, uh, uh, to rehearse with the Metropole Orchestra, mm -hmm. And Rob Pronk, this conductor, and they wrote charts. We talked, correspond. I, I did some. We did doodling. Conte and I did doodling a couple of other things together. And he did four of his own. I did four. And the same with the Finley, Chuck and uh, yeah. Bob. And the orchestra, you turn your head, and if they have a bassy thing in the brass, it's just scary. Now, it's, it's backed by the government. Now we'll release them. You understand? But we never. And, Meeting Doc Schuster, knocked on he called us in Rotterdam the first opening night after two two weeks we have an album. Knocked on the door and he had the interpreter and he hugged everybody, bravo, bravo, loves jazz, loves jazz. I did Boy Meets Home with a bit with eighty five men, you know, <laughs> things like that. And it turned out wonderful. And he did I saw a tape of what he did with the Philharmonic and he and uh, Maurice Andre later he picked a little trumpet and, and Doc Schuster on the trumpet. He, he has since come here two or three times, just most marvelous guy you ever want to meet in your life. He said, I was better when I was younger, he said. <laughs> and I couldn't believe that sound of this. Yeah. Unbelievable. Wow. Yeah. Well, this has been really quite fascinating. Well, it has yeah. been for me. I'm recalling things I forgot. Yeah, right. I'm sorry. Well, uh, when we do part two Mark. down the line, oh, we'll, we'll any, make up for all this. Anytime, Mark. Yeah. I hope it helps the archives. Yeah, I'm sure it will. A, I, I hope so. I'll talk, I told Conti I was going to be seeing you. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. He said to say hello. Yeah. So thanks for your time, and Thank I you. wish you continued success with, thanks. with all your future Anytime I can be of any help. Can you imagine school? someday if someone showed up at your house with every record you ever played on? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I couldn't. You have to. Because I don't know. Home. I don't remember. Yeah. You know. That'd be wild. Gosh, I'm still, still active and in good health, so. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for everything, really. Great. All right. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Mom. Thank you so much. And 